Hi, and welcome to MC Squared, a podcast where we interview people who have made groundbreaking discoveries in the realms of physics and mathematics. Today, we are interviewing Mark Reed, a professor of applied physics at Yale University, about how he and his collaborators shrunk memory to the molecular level by building an electorate the size of a single molecule. So, Professor Reed, what's an electorate in the first place? So an electret is a material that has a spontaneous electric field. Um, the molecules inside the material line up with each other, and due to the interaction between the molecules, then they all line up in the same direction and create this electric field. Electrets are very useful for, on a number of different reasons. Um, in, in fact, the uh, small, you know, microphone buds that we all use in the small microphones actually utilize electrets to be able to create the sound. They also can be used as far as memory elements. If the electric fields are aligned in one direction, that could potentially be a binary one. If they're lined up in the other direction, that could be a binary zero. So very common, very useful devices that are used uh, pretty much ubiquitously in electronics. Why is it interesting to try and shrink the size of the electret? So because electrets can be used as a memory element and it's due to the interaction between the different molecules, um, a question would be if you want to make a memory element smaller and smaller, as you get smaller, you have less molecules, they interact less, and so the, um, the probability is an electret, as it starts to become smaller, uh, would not keep its properties. So our investigation was to see if there were some other potential mechanisms to be able to keep this electret-type behavior when you scale down to as small as you possibly could, a single molecule. So in the end, you and your collaborators were able to shrink the electret to the size of a single molecule after all. So can you explain the theoretical framework behind how this works and the experimental process behind actually getting it to work and building it? Sure. So, um, the interest in doing this came from noticing some literature that had some results which weren't well explained, where a cage of carbon, what's called a buckyball, um, or fullerene, um, had a molecule or had an atom inside it and showed some unusual behavior as far as what the electronic transport was. So we started to think about this and ask ourselves, perhaps this is really showing some sort of bistable electric field configuration. In other words, an electret type behavior. So uh, we made some molecules, which were a carbon cage made out of 82 atoms of carbon and a gadolidium atom inside it similar to what some other people had investigated. And so we made some transistors where the, where this cage was connected to contacts, source and drain contacts, the input and output of a transistor and a gate nearby that would control things. And we started to do measurements on what would happen if, uh, if we change the electric field such that the atom inside, which was a gadolinium atom, uh, would move from one side of the cage to the other side of the cage. And in fact, what we found was uh, the behavior that would correspond to an electron. And the way we did the measurements was to be able to move the atom, look at the characteristics of the transistor, which would allow us to measure the various types of energies involved, and then apply an electric field that would move the atom to the other side of the cage at a different type of position, 
and again measure the energies and the things involved and the end result was that the only way we could explain it was by an electret type behavior and what was nice about this is we would move the atom to um, move the gadolinium atom to one side of the cage and it would be stable and it would have a certain type of transfer characteristic then we would move it to the other side of the cage and we would measure it and it would have different characteristics and that corresponded to a memory type function. So in fact, we actually demonstrated a read and write and read and write uh, type memory out of, out of this behavior. So throughout this entire process, which I imagine was filled with a plethora of challenges, um, what would you say was the challenge that was most difficult to overcome? And how did you end up overcoming it? So the, the measurements that we did um, and being able to create these small molecule transistors um, today is still very challenging. So this is not really a technology at this stage. It's trying to understand the basic physics of what goes on. Um, we only have... Um, a few percent yield of useful devices out of all the devices we make. So many of the devices just don't work at all. They don't show anything. Um, but once we get a device that works, then it works beautifully. So um, unlike present day silicon technology, which has wonderful yield and every device you make works and they all work exactly the same, the field that we're looking at isn't at that level and probably never will be at that level. However, what's important is to understand the underlying physics of what goes on so that someday down the road when people are able to think about how to incorporate these types of structures into a high yield process, you could have single molecule memories. So how did we overcome it? Blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> it was making many devices many hours of measuring devices that didn't work. Um, but once we got that one device that worked, then, then it was fun. Then we could investigate the, the basic physics of what was going on. And this is true in, in a lot of this work right now. Prior to this, our laboratory uh, demonstrated a, um, a single molecule transistor. Um, and it was very much the same thing. Many devices didn't work, but once we got one that worked, it worked beautifully. We understood it. And what it is, is the investigation of devices literally at the single molecule level. Why did you choose to do research on this topic? What inspired you? Well, frankly, we didn't know that we were going to find an electret. Um, we, um, the collaboration that we had, our laboratory had experience making these single molecule devices and the people that were doing the experiments at Nanjing University were interested in looking at this type of behavior. So I collaborated with them and, you know, taught them the technology on how to make these types of things and um, collaborated with them on all the various types of strange effects that you see in these kind of things. So um, it was really a very, very fruitful collaboration for them to learn how to do this kind of technology. <clears throat> and before this, we looked at some other types of single molecule structures that were, that were kind of interesting, but this new phenomena was the result of reading some literature that wasn't well understood. And so the, so we decided to delve into this to see if we could understand um, what these other people were trying to do, but didn't quite understand what was going on. Um, and then as a result of the experiments, then the only way we could explain it was by an electret. So it wasn't planned. It was, let's take a look at this because this is interesting. And P 
people don't understand what's going on. And if someone tells you that they thought of something, they did the experiment, and it worked the first time, don't believe them. <laughs> Uh, very often the way science works is kind of messy, is that you, uh, you do some experiments, you have a lot of questions, you aren't sure what's going on, and then after a while, then you start to get ideas and you do a control experiments and then are eventually able to explain it. And that's how this worked. What are the implications of this research? Yeah, so the... Um, as I mentioned before, um, this moves the ability of an electret down to the single molecule level. Um, and as I also mentioned before, the way that we did this experiment is just not scalable and, and not a technology. However, to uncover the basic physics of what's going on will stimulate people to think about can I actually make some other types of structures that incorporates these types of things to be able to make ultimately scaled memory elements? And we're thinking about alternatives to be able to do that, but more important, the world will hopefully now start to think about that and eventually incorporate these types of structures in next generation Memory, memory systems. So it is, um, it's one step along the path to be able to scale things to ultimately small dimensions. That concludes this episode of MC Squared. Thank you so much to Professor Reed for agreeing to be interviewed for the podcast. To all the listeners, thank you for tuning in and we hope to catch you next time.